Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our webinar in celebration of Food Allergy Awareness Week. My name is Lisbeth Garcia, and I am a management analyst in the Division of Health and Wellness. I am in charge of the Epinephrine in Schools program here at ASI. I want to welcome you this morning to the webinar tips for managing food allergies in the cafeteria which will assist you in providing students a safe meal and a safe environment to consume their meals. This webinar was adapted from CDC's Food Allergies in Schools Toolkit, which covers the role of school nutrition professionals, which is also based in the CDC Voluntary Guidelines for Managing Food Allergies in Schools and Early Care and Education Programs. As I mentioned, this webinar is part of our Food Allergy Awareness Week celebration, which is from May 14th through the 20th, and the week is coming to an end, but I encourage you to check out our website with more information and activities that you can do to celebrate Food Allergy Awareness Month, which is the month of May, and you can do these activities at school throughout the year to raise awareness about food allergies. And you can still nominate yourself or someone you know as an allergy ally. We will send more information after the webinar, but there is a um, campaign that Food Allergy Research and Education, also known as FAIR, is also doing throughout this week. And before moving forward, I wanted to clarify that this is an informational webinar and it is different from our epinephrine administration training. If you're interested in getting certified in the administration of epinephrine, then you will need to take an epinephrine administration training, which we offer virtually on a live um, setting like this or on demand. And I will also send more information on how you can get certified if you're interested. And just sharing some housekeeping, um, this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording and the slide deck after the webinar and we will also have it up on our website for future reference. And I encourage you to share it with other school staff that were unable to join us this morning so that this information um, is available for them as well. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to ask them as they come up or you can type, uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand to unmute yourself. We will also have time for questions and discussion at the end of the webinar. And before we start, I'd like to know who's joining us this morning. So if you can please share your name, the name of your school, and your favorite summer activity, you can type it in the chat or you can raise your hand to unmute your microphone. And let me see if we have any responses in the chat. And I will start. My name is Lisbeth Garcia, as I mentioned. I am in the Office Division of Health and Wellness, and my favorite summer activity is going to the beach. Anyone wants to share? Rashida at Thur Thurgood Marshall Academy. Her favorite activity is traveling. Ooh. Rachel from Aussie. I love a good July 4th cookout. Yes. Summer is almost here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Feel free to continue sharing your name, your school, and your favorite summer activity. Lafette, I love... Sh oh, wait, it's going so fast. <laughs> the beach and working on my tan. Yes. Natalia from Early Childhood Academy, and I also love the beach. Yes. Rashida at Eagle Academy, welcome. Reading books, Stan Ingraham, Early Childhood Academy, swimming, running, and skating. Ooh, we have a lot of people that love the beach, like me. We also have other activities, reading, swimming and running, and traveling, and family time. Yes, I hope we all have a great summer. Really looking forward. Any place near water. Leslie at Howard University Middle School. Yes. Thank you so much. Feel free to continue dropping your favorite activities. Um, and before going into the webinar, I wanted to get um, gauge your baseline knowledge about food allergies. 
So if you can go on slido.com and enter the code 241006, or you can also scan the QR code with your phone to access the quiz. And I'm going to drop the link in the chat as well. Um, let's see. So don't be afraid. It's just a quick quiz to see how much do you know about food allergies? All right. And I see some people are joining here. We have nine. All right, let's start. So the first question is, individuals with a food allergy can safely consume small amounts of that food. Is that true or false? So submit your answer. I'm not going to share the correct answers because I'm going to do the exact same quiz at the end to see how your knowledge changed. And then at the end, we will definitely show the correct answers. All right. 13 of you have submitted a response, 14. Great, next question. Food allergy and food intolerance means the same thing. Is that right? Is that correct or is that incorrect? Okay, time is up. Next question. High heat cooking, for example, oil deep frying or using the griddle, destroys most food allergens. Is that true or false? Okay. Next question. Removing an allergen from a finished dish, for example, removing nuts, if you made a salad or any other dish, provides a safe meal for a student with food allergy. Is that true or false? And next question, reactions to food can happen even if the individual never ingests the food. Is that true or false? And the last question, individuals who receive epinephrine always need to go to the emergency room even if they feel well. Is that true or false? And that's the last question. Thank you for participating. Um, as I mentioned, at the end, we'll do the same quiz and we will see how your knowledge has changed. So I'm not showing the correct answers now, um, but thank you for participating. And we're gonna see how your knowledge changes throughout this webinar. So for the next slide, um, where we are. So before starting, I also wanted to share a quick disclaimer. 
um, that the information in this training is for educational purposes only, and you should always seek the advice of a medical physician uh, or healthcare professional in, in case you have any questions regarding a medical condition or before making medical decisions. And there may be situations where students who have known allergies have been given different recommendations from the ones from those outlined in this program. And in those cases, you will follow the individualized instructions from their physician, which are provided in their action plan for anaphylaxis. Um, so the agenda for this morning, we will cover an overview of food allergy related legislation, background information about food allergies, how to identify and respond to anaphylaxis, and four key strategies to prevent anaphylaxis in the school cafeteria and also share resources from reliable sources. And again, I wanted to um, just uh, let you know again that the section about identifying and responding to anaphylaxis is also an overview. And if you want to learn more and get certified, I invite you to get certified through our epinephrine administration training. So today we will do a quick overview. So starting with the legislation related to food allergies, there are federal legislation that requires manufacturers to list whether their products contain any of the major food allergens, including the 2004 Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act, or FOGPA. And this act identifies nine major food allergens or eight major food allergens required on food labels. And then in 2021, the Food Allergy Safety Treatment Education and Research, or FASTER Act, became effective in January 2023 and requires sesame to be labeled on packaged food. So there are eight major allergens um, that were required through the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act in 2004. And then in 2021, sesame was added as a major allergen. And here in DC, in response to feedback from students, families, and advocates offered in a committee report, the DC Council passed the legislation Access to Emergency Epinephrine in Schools Amendment Act of 2015. This act requires district public and public charter schools to have undesignated epinephrine available at all times and school staff certified in recognizing anaphylactic symptoms and administering epinephrine. This school staff does not include the school nurse, so this act was created to expand capacity beyond school nurses. The committee report for the legislation cites an incident in 2012 in Virginia where a seven-year-old student consumed a peanut on the playground and had an immediate allergy reaction. She had a known allergy but did not have a prescribed epinephrine auto-injector at her school. And by the time the paramedics arrived, she was in cardiac arrest and later died. Unfortunately, this incident happened in Virginia and it was included in the report. The advocates say that her life could have been saved if the school had stuck epinephrine. And this is why here in DC, we have the Emergency Epinephrine Schools Act and we have the Epinephrine in Schools Program to ensure that students have access to epinephrine in the event they have an anaphylactic reaction, whether or not they have a prescription for that epinephrine. The act also authorizes certified public school staff to possess and administer epinephrine auto-injectors on behalf of students suffering or about to suffer an anaphylactic episode. And they must be on the premises, on the school premises during all school operating hours and as I mentioned, cannot include the health suite personnel because this was created to expand capacity. The health suite personnel can um, respond, and if they are available, of course, they're most uh, qualified professional to administer epinephrine, but if they're not available, this is why we have at least two staff members available at each school. And some background about the epinephrine in schools program. Um, as I mentioned, it was created following the Access to Emergency Epinephrine School Amendment Act of 2015. And each school has an LEA, or each school or LEA has an epinephrine liaison who serves as office primary contact for the program at the school level. 
liaisons should introduce themselves to the school health suite personnel to improve communications within the school. And as part of the program, schools also receive two twin packs, each containing two easy to use spring loaded syringes of epinephrine, which are called epinephrine auto injectors. These are received free of charge. And they also receive free replacements for used, damaged, and expired auto injectors. Per DC municipal regulations, schools are responsible for restocking lost or stolen auto injectors. So we encourage you to familiarize yourself with the certified staff members at your school and establish a relationship if you don't have one already or um, if you are not your epinephrine uh, program liaison. Uh, some of you, I see that you are the program liaison at your school, but if you are a food service staff member or another staff member at your school, make sure that you introduce yourself and familiarize yourself with the program and with your liaison and also health suite personnel. You may also get certified and be an additional certi certified staff at your school to administer epinephrine. As I mentioned, we offer an on-demand course and also a live training. So I will be sending that information in the follow-up emails along with the slide. So now that we cover a little bit about the legislation, um, let's see what is an allergy. Um, why are they um, life-threatening? How does it work? So um, we're going to share also some background information about the prevalence of food allergies. And allergies are a growing food safety and public health concern in schools across the United States. There are approximately 400,000 school age children that are affected by food allergies. And because students spend a great deal of time in school, this is where the risk of exposure to allergens um, is higher. Schools play a major role in helping children manage their allergies. And here in this slide, we have information about um, some of the statistics related to food allergies. There are approximately 25% uh, of severe food allergy reactions happen at school in students that have no previous known food allergy. So some of the reactions happen when they don't even know they're allergic to that food. So they don't have an epinephrine auto injector and they don't have an action plan for anaphylaxis. And individuals with food allergies who also have asthma may be at an increased risk for severe or fatal food allergy reactions. And studies show that African-American children are at significantly greater risk of developing food allergy. And African-American and Latino children received less follow-up care for food allergy from an allergy specialist and had higher rates of food allergy-related anaphylaxis and emergency room visits. So, you know, some background information about the prevalence of food allergies and in the population, especially here in D.C., most of our students are of background, um, African, American, or Latino background. So it's something important to keep in mind. And this is why this program is important. And I thank you for your time here today. So some background information about food allergies. So what is an allergy? Allergies occur when the immune system responds to a substance that either enters the body, whether it is through ingestion, inhalation, injection, or skin contact. Sometimes we think that because it is a food allergy, you need to eat that food or the student or individual needs to actually eat or consume that food to have a reaction. But just by inhaling the allergen, um, having skin contact, they can have a reaction. Food allergies may limit a major life activity and may qualify an individual for protection under the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 or ADA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. An allergy is an exaggerated or abnormal response to a substance known as an allergen. And allergens, as I mentioned, can enter the body in four ways. The response triggered by allergies varies by person, exposure, incident, and allergens. Allergens are usually harmless, but the body feels as if they are under attack, so they will um, activate the immune response. In food allergies, the allergen is a protein that is found in that particular food. And anaphylaxis is a severe systemic allergic reaction, and hospitalizations for anaphylaxis are on the rise, 
However, the National Institute of Health believes more research is needed to determine the number of anaphylactic-related deaths. But remember, anaphylaxis is a potentially life-threatening systemic allergic reaction. And before we move to the next slide, I want to ask you to try naming the nine common food allergens. Um, if you are aware of them, you can type them in the chat or raise your hand to unmute your microphone. Any volunteers? So nine food allergens. Peanuts, I see. Selfish, awesome. Soy, yay. You're getting correct answers. Wheat, yes. <laughs> Milk, that's correct. Gluten. Dairy, mm -hmm. awesome. You are froze. Tree nuts, that's another one, yes. So here we have the list of common allergens that cause anaphylaxis. To the left, we have the food allergens, and to the right, we have non-food allergens. And you know, the focus of this webinar is food allergies, but we also wanted to highlight and, and inform you that there are other uh, triggers to anaphylaxis besides food. So uh, again, on the left, we have the food allergens and we have tree nuts, peanuts, shellfish, fish, wheat, eggs, soy, milk, and sesame, which was added uh, starting this January, 2023. These are responsible for 90% of all anaphylaxis cases, and many schools have different policies to limit or eliminate possible exposures to these allergens. Some schools have nut-free stones or any other type of um, allergen-free stone, and practicing this and detailed hand washing and limiting food sharing can also limit exposure and cross contact. Since strict avoidance is the only way to prevent anaphylaxis, these policies help create safer environments for our students. And as I mentioned, we have the non-food allergens here, and we've had incident reports of uh, anaphylactic, re anaphylactic, anaphylactic reactions related to non-food allergens, such as bee stings. Um, so we have insect stings, latex, medication, and exercise-induced anaphylaxis. And in some cases, this is very rare, but in some cases, the exercise-induced anaphylaxis has been linked to uh, food that they consume prior to exercising. So again, here are the allergens, the common allergens that cause anaphylaxis. A very important thing to remember is that students or individuals may have uh, an allergy, a food allergy that is not listed here. So you will still treat it as a as an allergy. So it doesn't um it doesn't necessarily need to be one of the common food allergens to be, you know, considered an allergy. Any food can be an allergen. So as I mentioned is the protein found in that food. So I had um I used to work at a charter school before joining Aussie and we had a blueberry Stone, like blueberry free stone because we have students that were allergic to blueberries. So any food again can be an allergen and you should still treat it very seriously. If you notice that someone is having a reaction, it doesn't necessarily need to be after consuming any of these um, food items. It could be other food items as well. And I know sometimes we may think about seasonal allergies, um, but it is very rare that seasonal allergies such as pollen or dust mite may or mold cause anaphylaxis. It is very uncommon uh, for that to happen. And I attended a conference at the Children's National Hospital in November 2019. This seems like so far away. Um, but I had the opportunity to ask an allergist if seasonal allergies could cause anaphylaxis. And she said that it was very uncommon. So these are the common as I mentioned, food allergens and non-food allergens. OK. 
Okay, so the next slide, it is very important to know the difference between an allergy and a food intolerance to avoid mistreating the symptoms. So some of the key differences is that food allergy involves the immune system, whereas food intolerance is mainly the digestive system responding. Food allergy presents with a gradual onset, sorry, a sudden onset, and food intolerances presents with a gradual onset. For food allergies, even the smallest amount of food can cause anaphylaxis. And with food intolerances, it um, occurs when a lot of the food is eaten or when it is eaten often. And with food allergies, it happens all the time. The food is consumed or the, every time the person has contact with that food allergen. Food allergies can become life-threatening whereas food uh, intolerances are generally not life-threatening. So can someone name some uh, food intolerances that you are aware of or that you know? Sometimes the symptoms may be very similar, but the main thing to remember is that food allergy is a systemic response, so it's the entire system responding, and with food intolerances, it's just the digestive sy system. So you will see... Um, symptoms like cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or other gastrointestinal symptoms, but you won't see some other symptoms that we're going to cover related to anaphylaxis. And I have food intolerance to citrus and run runny eggs, lactose, gluten, lactose intolerance. Yes, that is very common. And it's, it's not the same. It is something serious as well, but food allergies can become life-threatening if they're not treated right away. Okay, some basic medical facts about food allergies is that there is no cure for food allergies and there is no way to cure it. There are no vaccinations. And as a result, the only way to prevent anaphylactic reactions is to avoid exposure to the allergen. To ensure their safety, children with known food allergens must also have the epinephrine available to uh, treat any anaphylactic reaction they may have. Because exposure is how allergies are discovered, a person may be allergic to a food but have no knowledge. So as I mentioned, sometimes in schools, um, the students have their first reaction and they don't have an action plan for anaphylaxis because they've never had a reaction before. Um, maybe they were never exposed to that allergen at home and they're first exposed at school. Any amount of exposure, as I was mentioning, can lead to a severe life-threatening reaction and even the smallest amount may still cause an anaphylactic reaction. And the reactions may progress differently with its with each exposure, and this is why removing the allergen and minimizing future exposures are is so critical. And anaphylaxis can develop immediately or over the course of several hours. So this is also important to keep in mind. If someone has uh, something for breakfast at home or on the way to school, they may have a reaction hours later when they're in the classroom. Or if they had a meal in the cafeteria, they may not have a reaction right there in the cafeteria. Sometimes they may, they might have it. It can happen um, suddenly, you know, minutes after, or it can happen over the course of several hours. So they may be in another classroom when the reaction happens. But it's important to remember that. And I wanted to include information about the impact of food allergy on quality of life. And the daily burden and challenges of living with food allergies, not only for the child, but for their family, are often overlooked and minimized. Because food is a fundamental part of many daily activities and social events, families living with food allergy must be constantly vigilant to keep the child safe. The fear of anaphylaxis can take a heavy toll on children and their caregivers, and parents of children with food allergy can experience anxiety, depression, isolation and stress associated with the risk of reaction and possible societal, societal stigma as well. Children with food allergies may develop levels of anxiety regarding a fear of food, and they may also be too scared to eat at school.
school or anywhere away from home and may develop a sense of food aversion. Upon entering school, children often may experience fear and anxiety as a result of being around others who do not struggle with food allergies. And as a result, a child may feel left out or isolated from friends and normal activities. They may even feel friendless or lonely. And many children with food allergies report being bullied at school. For many, the constant fear of accidental exposure to food allergens leads to a loss of normalcy and results in adjustments in decision-making and daily routine. If we think about it, food is present everywhere from, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, like the classroom, if we have um, snacks or meals served in the classroom, when we go out, celebrations, even on planes, traveling. So families with food allergies really have a constant fear. And this adds a uh, complexity in navigating school, childcare, and social activities. And many parents need to spend extra time, money, and effort around meal prep, grocery shopping, and event planning and attendance. Sometimes they just decide not to go out or do activities because they're afraid of encountering the allergen. And caring for children with food allergies costs the United States nearly $25 billion annually, and it can cost a family around $4,184 per child per year. So it's just something to keep in mind um, of the challenges of having food allergies and the impact on their quality of life. So next, um, the next section, we want to share information about how to identify and respond to anaphylaxis. As I mentioned, this is a very quick overview. And if you want to get more information or if you want to get certified, I invite you to take our epinephrine administration training. So here we have this image of a child with, and it has different areas. Um, you may see there are some areas that are highlighted in red. These are considered major areas. And any symptoms, anyone having or showing symptoms affecting any of these areas, throat, heart, or lungs, should quickly receive an epinephrine auto-injector. Delays of up to 30 minutes can lead to a fatal reaction, so it's important to know, um, quickly identify the symptoms, know how to respond. If you're not certified, make sure you um, go find the nurse or one of the certified school staff. And the symptoms of allergic reactions to food vary both in type and severity among different people and even in the same person over time. So they may not always show the same symptoms um, every time they have an encounter with their allergen. And as I mentioned before, the signs and symptoms may be Come evident in a few minutes or up to one to two hours after exposure to their allergen, or rarely even several hours later. And a severe life-threatening allergic reaction is called anaphylaxis. So when someone is having mild symptoms, so any symptoms that are not highlighted in red are considered mild symptoms. If someone is having symptoms affecting one area not highlighted in red and it's a mild uh, symptom, you will monitor the student and see if they develop additional symptoms or if their symptoms worsen. But if they develop uh, severe symptoms, for example, if they have mild itchiness or tingling in their mouth area, it is considered a mild symptom. If they have significant swelling of their mouth, of their tongue, or, the, or their lips, it is considered a severe symptom and they should quickly get the epinephrine auto injector. So here we have the nose, um, hay, hay fever-like symptoms like runny, itchy nose, red, watery eyes. By itself, this is not enough for us to determine that it is an anaphylactic reaction, so we will monitor. But sometimes these nose symptoms may appear with other symptoms when someone is having an anaphylactic reaction. So the key takeaway, take if it's mild, you will monitor. If it's severe, you will quickly respond by uh, administering the epinephrine auto injector or finding someone who's certified or the school nurse. Um, people who begin experiencing any of these symptoms should stop eating the food immediately 
and evaluate the need of using emergency medications such as epinephrine and seek medical attention. Some of these may not always show up, so skin symptoms are a common symptom that we think about when we think about a food allergic reaction or an allergic reaction, but be aware that they're not always present and they may not always develop. If you notice someone has severe symptoms or symptoms affecting two or more areas not highlighted in red that qualifies as an anaphylactic reaction. And in children, food allergy reactions may be difficult to see and also report. Some children may not be able to clearly communicate their symptoms due to their age or their development. And they may say things like, it feels like something is in my throat, I feel like my tongue is heavy, or my tongue or mouth is tingling or burning, my tongue or mouth itches, my mouth feels funny. So these are some uh, ways that children may report their symptoms. So always you know, pay attention to what they're reporting and how their symptoms are presenting. So responding to anaphylaxis, and there is no, uh, Treatment to prevent food allergy reactions, the only way to prevent is to strictly avoid the allergen, but avoidance is not always possible, and you must be prepared to deal with allergic reactions, including severe allergic reactions, also known as anaphylaxis. Immediate administration of epinephrine is the first line of defense against anaphylactic reactions. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, to be injected within minutes of the onset of symptoms, and it opens the airways and improves circulation, working to disrupt the body's immune response to the allergen. It is typically given by an auto-injector, which is a spring-loaded syringe used to deliver a measured dose of the epinephrine. The medication is designed to be easy to administer by those without a medical background, and besides the school nurse, your school is required to have a minimum of two staff certified annually by OSI. And your school may have additional staff certified through DC Health Administration of Medication Training. And as I mentioned before, I encourage you to familiarize yourself with your school's certified staff and your school's undesignated epinephrine auto-injector plan, which is the emergency action plan for responding to anaphylaxis. More than one dose may be needed if the symptoms do not improve within five to 10 minutes, or if they experience a biphasic reaction, which is when anaphylactic symptoms return after epinephrine is being administered. So it may not be the exact same symptoms, but they may have a second round of symptoms, and that is called a biphasic reaction. If you suspect that someone is having a reaction or the student is uh, accidentally exposed to their allergen, activate the emergency action plan immediately and call the school nurse or the certified administrator. Never send a student with a suspected allergic reaction to the school nurse alone because uh, standing has been linked to blood, um, low blood pressure and this can also result in a fatal reaction. And always call 911 after administering epinephrine, and because they may have a biphasic reaction or their symptoms may worsen, it is critical to, be, uh, to remain under medical observation. As I mentioned, not treating anaphylaxis promptly may result also in a fatal reaction Delays of up to 30 minutes can result in a fatal reaction. And if a parent or guardian refuses emergency department visits for their child, we encourage you to obtain their refusal in writing. And after administering epinephrine, call 911 and request an ambulance with uh, epinephrine. So you will let them know that this is um, allergic reaction or an anaphylactic reaction. So they know to send an ambulance with epinephrine because not all ambulances are equipped with the same medication. So again, that was a quick, very quick overview of how to respond. For more in-depth uh, information, I encourage you to uh, visit our website and also take our training. So now, managing uh, uh, 
uh, food allergies in the cafeteria, I wanted to show you four key strategies to prevent anaphylaxis in the school cafeteria. And managing food allergies in a busy school environment can be challenging. The USDA Food and Nutrition Service Office of Food Safety provides school nutrition professionals with training and resources to better understand food allergies, identify reactions, and respond to emergencies. These resources help school nutrition professionals communicate the importance of allergy management and response activities to the entire school environment. One of the best ways to prevent accidental food allergy exposures in the cafeteria is to develop and follow procedures for handling food allergies, food allergens in the cafeteria, even if a student is not participating in the school meal program. So always um, have procedures in place, even if they're not participating in the meal program. So here is an overview of the four key strategies. And the first one is identifying students with known food allergens reading food labels, preventing cross-contact of possible food allergens, and promoting communication and teamwork. The actions and planning of school nutrition professionals are important to ensure healthy and safe schools for students with food allergies. So thank you so much for joining. The first one um, we have is identifying students. So some of the uh, actions included here are using point of purchase alerts to identify students with food allergies. Do not allow students to take items that might contain their allergens and be familiar with their 504 plan or other meal accommodation plan. And the 504 plan is a legally binding care plan between a family and the child's school and it addresses how the school will accommodate the child's food allergies. The name comes from the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Under this law, schools that get federal funding cannot exclude or discriminate against students who have disabilities. And according to the Section 504 and the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, a food allergy is often considered a disability depending on how severe the allergy is. Keep in mind that federal laws do not allow outward identification of students with food allergies. For example, posting a list of students in public areas, that's not something that we should be doing. You should post this information in locations that are visible only for food service staff, like the kitchen or behind counters and serving lines. We encourage you to make nutrition information available to students, families, and school nurse, and this do it for all of the school meals, beverages, and snacks. This will allow families of students with food allergies to make informed decisions and you know, either pack their lunch or uh, work with the school to have a meal accommodation. Conduct frequent meetings with food service staff to review menu items and identify potential allergens. And clearly identify menu items that meet specific dietary criteria like lactose-free, nut-free, et cetera, instead of identifying students with allergies. Manage food substitutions for students with allergies and work with parents, school nurse, and administrators to manage these for the students with food allergies. We encourage you to accommodate family preferences even if they do not have a meal accommodation plan provided by a medical professional. On the advice of healthcare providers and parents, some schools may establish special cafeteria seating for students with life-threatening food allergies. Sometimes these tables are referred to as peanut-free or allergy-safe tables. If these arrangements are made, every effort should be made to allow other students to also sit at the allergen-free tables as long as they do not have the allergen on their trays or their lunches. For example, if a child has an allergy to a specific fruit or vegetable, you may substitute with another fruit or vegetable. And we encourage you to contact your uh, program specialist if you have questions about substituting meals or alter uh, meal alterations in order to accommodate a student's food allergy, but remain compliant with USDA 
and Healthy Schools Act nutrition requirements. And we have them here. So if you have any questions, um, you can also drop them in the chat or wait uh, until the end, and we can also discuss that. And another uh, key strategy is reading food labels and understanding how to read food labels and identify allergens. Sometimes natural flavors can hide many potential allergens. And the legislat federal legislation requires manufacturers to list nine major food allergens, but always check the labels. And if you have any questions, contact the manufacturers for other potential allergens. FAIR has many resources to understand food labels, and we will also include that at the end and share it with you um, after on the follow-up email. But there are three ways to identify allergens in labels. One is when they list the common name of the allergen in the ingredient section. So, for example, it will say milk, fish, shrimp, walnut, sesame. Another way is when it's listed in parentheses when the ingredient is a less common form of the allergen. For example, whey protein, and then in parentheses, it will say milk, lecithin, and then in parentheses, it will say soy, and natural flavors, in parentheses, for example, it will say almond. And another way of identifying allergies, allergens in labels um, is looking at the contained word. Sometimes they will use the word contained followed by the name of the allergen listed after the ingredients. For example, contains milk, soy, and almond. Keep in mind that phrases like peanut-free and egg-free are not regulated, and always check with the manufacturer if you have questions about the ingredient list. The next key strategy is preventing cross-contact, and this is very important during food preparation and service on utensils, equipment, and surfaces. Always wash your hands with soap and water before and after preparing and serving food. Clean and sanitize any surfaces that come in contact with food with soap and water or all-purpose agents. Plain water or using hand sanitizers to wash your hands or clean your hands do not effectively remove allergens. And cross-contamination, sometimes we talk about um, food safety, and we mentioned cross-contamination. This is the transfer of microorganisms from a food person or surface to another food. This can cause foodborne illness. When we talk about cross-contact, this means the transfer of allergen from one food to another food or surface, and it can cause an allergic reaction. As we mentioned, allergic reactions can turn into anaphylaxis, which is a severe systemic reaction. Cross-contact procedures refer to the control methods used to protect students from allergens when accommodating a food allergy. If you make a mistake, you cannot just remove an allergen from a meal. As we mentioned, even the smallest amount can, ca can cause a reaction and it can make the food unsafe. And food service personnel should always wash their hands and develop and follow procedures for cleaning food preparation areas and cafeteria tables and chairs. An example of cross-contact is when a deep fryer is used to cook shrimp, and now the oil contains the proteins which will affect a person with a shellfish allergy. So it's very common to think that high temperature will destroy allergens, but they do not destroy those proteins they may destroy um, other microorganisms, but not the proteins. Another example is when you make uh, use a griddle to cook scrambled eggs. If the griddle is not properly cleaned, then you pr um, prepare a turkey sandwich, for example, and serve it with someone who has an egg allergy. Now, the person has a reaction because they were uh, accidentally exposed to their allergen via cross-contact. Or using a knife to make peanut butter sandwiches, wiping the knife and then using it to cut a grilled cheese sandwich and giving it to someone with a nut allergy. Although they didn't directly consume the allergen, 
they were accidentally exposed due to cross contact. So this is very important to keep in mind that we need to thoroughly wash our hands, utensils, cutting boards, any, any surfaces that come in contact with food. And some key strategies are um, making several, uh, in, when you're making several foods, making the uh, allergy safe foods first, and then making the regular foods later, keeping the safe foods covered and away from other foods that may splatter, and always label and store allergen free items separately and we encourage you to use color coding and also designate allergen free areas to prepare meals. So this is some, some information and we will share all of this with you and additional resources as well. The last section, our key strategy is promoting communication and teamwork. We encourage you to implement an inclusive team approach Good communication between parents, teachers, school nurse, school service staff is essential for providing a safe environment for students with food allergies. Always familiarize yourself with certified staff at your school and establish a relationship with the program liaison and health suite personnel. And we encourage you to develop and follow procedures for handling food allergens in the cafeteria, even if a student is not participating in the school meal program and incorporate these in the schools on designated epinephrine auto-injector plan or UEA plan, which is created and updated by the school's epinephrine liaison. We also uh, recommend you to follow students' medical statement to avoid food allergens and understand what you need to know. And if you have questions, always ask if you're unsure. This will help communicate information, also help communicate information to all food service staff involved in managing a student's food allergy and make sure that you protect the privacy of children with food allergies and maintain confidentiality of their medical condition. Make meal modifications for students with food allergies. This can be made based on a medical statement or student's IEP or 504 plan and also can be made on a case-by-case -case basis. We encourage you to accommodate family preferences, even if they don't have a meal accommodation plan provided by a medical professional. And as I mentioned, we um, encourage you to reach out to your program specialist if you have questions. Another uh, recommendation is to share information about ingredients in food served at school. Provide the menu in advance to parents to assist in planning and make me menus available in multiple languages, share via email, newsletters, website, and also have printed copies available. Providing ongoing communication to parents and explain school's procedures for meal modification is another uh, key strategy. And work with teachers ahead of time to plan safe field trip meals and snacks for students with food allergies. So that is the summary of our four key actions, so identifying students with food allergies and recognize them and, and do not allow them to uh, grab an item that contains their allergen. Reading food labels, preventing cross contact of possible food allergens and promoting communication and teamwork and getting to know and familiarize yourself with the certified staff, the program liaison and the school nurse to develop, you know, specific procedures to manage reactions in the school cafeteria. So as a recap, um, you know, we have covered an overview of the legislation, some information about food allergies, how to identify and respond to anaphylaxis, and four key strategies to prevent anaphylaxis in the school cafeteria. And we will also share with you the food allergy resources for food service staff. And if you have questions, we encourage you Again, if you want to get certified, we encourage you to take our epinephrine administration training, which we'll share the link and details in the um, follow-up email. So with that, I want to open it to questions first, because I know we have five minutes left. Are there any questions? And then we want to also do a post-knowledge check and see how your knowledge changed after these. Uh, webinar. Let me 
see if there are any questions before going to the quiz. Lafette, let me I think you can unmute yourself now. I can, Lafette. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, this was a wonderful provision of information, so thank you for that. Um, and I just wanted to add that um for a lot of our SFAs and our providers, you know, your vendor or where you get your meals from can really help support you making sure that you have products available that do not, you know, um, cause a reaction or allergic reaction or even an intolerance for students. So um, I was just looking at the slide where we had the different partners listed and your vendors or food service providers certainly is a partner in making sure that you are providing safe meals for students. Great. Thank you for adding that. And thank you for being here, Lafette. Also, if any of you have questions related to meal accommodations and making sure that you meet the requirements, please contact Lafette or Alex or your um, program specialist. So now we're going to do the quiz um, just to see how your knowledge has improved or changed. We can, um, you can access it by um, scanning the QR code or entering the code 122451 uh, once you go to Slido.com. And I'm also going to share the link in the chat. Wait. Yes, you are here. Okay. Let me change my screen. And I see that most of you have joined, so we're going to start the quiz. The first question, individuals with a food allergy can safely consume small amounts of that food. Is that true or false? Make sure you submit your responses. So most of you say false, and that is the correct answer. The next question, food allergy and food intolerance means the same thing. Is that true or false? Seconds. And most of you say that's false, and that is correct. Next question High heat cooking, such as oil deep frying or using the griddle, destroys most food allergens. Is that true or false? We have five seconds left. Most of you say false, and that's correct. The next question, removing an allergen from a finished dish, dish such as removing the nuts from a salad, provides a safe meal for a student with food allergy. Is that full, um, true or false?
Okay, most of you say false, and that's correct. Two more questions. Uh, reactions to food can happen even if the individual never ingests the food. Is that true or false? Five seconds. Submit your answers. And most of you say true, and that's correct. And the last question, individuals who receive epinephrine always need to go to the emergency room, even if they feel well. Is that true or false? Now five seconds left. Awesome. So 88% says true, 13 says false. The correct answer is true. And this is because they may have a biphasic reaction or their symptoms, um, which means their symptoms return or a second round of symptoms are happens or their symptoms may not um subside and they may need additional doses. And I forgot to mention this, but we can only provide up to two doses and anything beyond that needs to be given by a medical professional. So that's why going to the emergency room is critical, remaining under medical observation, but also being um, there so that if they need additional doses, they can receive it. And we have a winner, Leslie Bowler at Howard Middle School. You responded in the least, least amount of time, all correct answers. So congratulations. Um, I know we kind of run out of time. I'm gonna switch it back to the presentation and open it for questions, um, comments, or anything new that you've learned that you wanna share, um, you can drop in the chat or name one key takeaway that you plan to implement at your school after this webinar. Thank you. And um, I apologize for running out of time and not having, uh, not sticking to the time, but we're almost done. So the resources here, we will share the slide deck with these links as well for you to access and get more information. And there are amazing resources here from different organizations and agencies. We have three pages of resources that we wanted to share. Um, so with that, I want to say thank you all for your time this morning and hope you have a great rest of your day and continue celebrating Food Allergy Awareness Week. We will share this and we invite you to share with all um, food service staff at your school or anyone that you um, feel like they should have this information. Um, and we will send more information again to continue participating in Food Allergy Awareness Week, which ends on the 20th. But, you know, food allergies happen year round and we are here year round providing support. So thank you so much. Have a great day. Enjoy. It's sunny day. It's sunny. It's great. Thank you. Thanks.